This is a message that we did two years ago almost to the day. So every couple of years we're going to do a message like this. Set this up here. Now this morning what we're going to do is we're going to examine the Lord's Supper and specifically we're going to be looking at the warnings that we see in 1 Corinthians 11 about taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Now, Bob and I promised a couple of years ago that every so often we would do a message like this as a reminder as to what the issues really were at Corinth that Paul was addressing when he warned them not to abuse the table of the Lord. Now, the reason we think this is such an important message is because unwittingly too many Christians have taken the examine yourself passage out of 1 Corinthians 11:28 to mean that somehow we as Christians ha we have to engage in some deep introspection where we examine our own heart to determine whether or not we're good enough for the table of the Lord. And so this in turn leads many Christians needlessly excluding themselves from the Lord's table or they end up excluding other brothers and sisters from the table of the Lord that he has established all by his grace and mercy for sinners. So today, we're going to learn two important truths. Number one, we're going to learn that at the table of the Lord that we're going to be celebrating today, Christ receives sinners. If you're going to have to wait until you're good enough to become a partaker of the Lord's Supper, you'll never end up coming. No, no one, truth be told, left to their own devices is good enough for the table that the Lord has given by his grace and his mercy alone. The second thing we're going to be learning is that the examine yourself passage has nothing to do with examining our hearts in an introspective way to determine if we're good enough for this supper, but instead it has to do with how we appreciate other believers in the body of Christ and that we recognize that every single person who's been purchased by the blood of Christ should have access to the table of the Lord. That's what we're going to be learning today. Now, I want to begin by looking at the significance and the richness of the table of the Lord from Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, I want you to remember in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is addressing various issues that the Corinthian Christians were struggling with. So he deals with various heresies, errors, and wicked practices that they were engaged in. Well, one of them was the abuse of the Lord's Supper. Now we know that because in 1 Corinthians 11:20, 20, Paul says, when you gather together, you Corinthian rascals, I'm adding that, it's not the Lord's Supper that you're having. Meaning whatever supper they were having, it was no longer the Lord's because of the abuse of it. Well, just three verses later, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, all the way to verse 26, Paul explains again afresh the significance and richness of the table. And so that's where we're going to begin. Paul said this, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, dear ones, notice here right in the beginning in verse 23, Paul says that he received from the Lord that which he delivered to the Corinthians. That's important. Because what that means is the one who delivers the table of the Lord and established it was not some church council. It was the Lord Jesus himself. And as such, he gets to determine who the guests are at his own table. And what we're going to learn is that Christ receives sinners. And if he does, and he's the Lord of the table, who are you and I or anyone else to object to the guests that Christ brings to his table? I think that that's an implication that we see right away. Now, there's four areas of significance within the Lord's Supper. The first two have to do with the elements, the bread and the, the wine, the cup. The second two have to do with the proclamation and the remembrance. Let's hit, hit them each one by one. First of all, notice here in 1 Corinthians 11:23 into 24, 
Jesus likens himself to bread, and specifically the bread that is broken. Does everyone see that? The question is, why does he do that? Well, remember in John chapter 6, Jesus likens himself to the bread of life. So what Jesus is getting at in John 6 is that just as the bread of life came down, the manna from heaven, to give temporary life to the Israelites in the wilderness at the Exodus event, Jesus now is the bread of life who comes down from heaven not just to give temporary life to the people of God, but eternal life to all those who would believe. Now, how does Jesus accomplish this? Well, he does so through his substitutionary death. And that's alluded to here when he says, this is my body which is for you. That phrase that I've underlined is laden with substitution. The idea here is literally you could render this, my body which is on your behalf. The preposition who pair can be rendered on behalf. So Jesus is saying that he is this, like this broken bread who is a substitute meaning he takes upon himself the full measure of God's wrath so that the people of God can what? We can go free. That is the core of the gospel. And that's why Jesus is using the bread. It is a pictorial proclamation of what he does on the cross. Substitutionary death for the sake of his people. Now, what about the cup? Notice here in verse 25, Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, a lot can be said about the cups themselves. I think there were four during Passover. But notice the emphasis here in the Lord's Supper is what the cup represents. The cup here represents Jesus shed blood, which institutes the new covenant. Now, why is that significant? Well, think back. If you and I are careful readers of the Bible, we realize that God doesn't just make covenants he cuts covenants. So go back to Genesis 15. Remember, God there cut a covenant with Abraham. Remember, Abraham cuts the animals, he lays them in two. But does Abraham walk the blood path? No. Who walks the blood path alone? God does. God alone walked the blood path. It is a unilateral covenant. Well, now the new covenant, which is a ratification and fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, notice who ratifies it. It's Jesus Christ who walks the blood path alone. It's no one else's blood. It's Jesus' blood that inaugurates and initiates the new covenant. Now, another passage you should have in the back of your minds is Exodus 24.8. In Exodus 24.8, remember the mediator of the old covenant, Moses? He's with the people of God at Sinai. And what does he do? He takes the blood of the bull and he sprinkles it upon the people and he says, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has cut with you in accordance with all these words. That's what the mediator of the old covenant did. But now what's being described here at the table of the Lord is Jesus is the mediator of the new and eternal covenant. And he sheds the blood upon his people, as it were, not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood, once and for all, to remove their sins and to usher in the new covenant. Dear ones, what you and I have to realize is that in the Lord's table, we have a graphic, pictorial proclamation of the core of the gospel. Not so says Eric Dalma, but so says the Apostle Paul. Notice in verse 26, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you do what? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The term proclaim there, cotton gallo, is gospel proclamation. And notice the tinge of good news here about the return. Jesus, because he overcame the grave, because he ascended on high and is coming back, we proclaim the Lord's death until what? Until he comes again. All of the good news of the gospel is pictorially represented and proclaimed in the Lord's Supper. Now, notice we also have this command twice in this passage by Jesus to do this Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. Does everyone see that highlighted in red? Now, when he says, do this in remembrance of me, that's not a suggestion. It's not a helpful idea, but in fact, it is a command. And when Jesus commands us to do this in remembrance of him, what are we to remember? Remember? 
Are we to remember how sinful and awful we are? No. We're to remember how great a Savior Christ is. And so this should tip us off that when we come to the warning passages, the warning passages aren't about introspection, about how bad we've been, but they're really about examining properly the body of Christ. And we'll explain what that means. Now, let's turn to the abused warning passages. I call them abused because I'm claiming the average evangelical today doesn't understand typically what the examine yourself passage is about. And that's what we want to remedy. We want to get this right. Now, let's keep reading here. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Paul says, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Now, everyone notice here the first phrase highlighted red. He says, a man must examine himself. Aha, this is what the debate is all about. The average evangelical today says when it, they look at the examine yourself, they think that that means that they have to examine their own heart to determine if they're good enough for the table of the Lord. Now, I'm going to be showing you that that's not the case, but let me cite evidence. I took this from the web, and I was looking just for the average church, how do they understand this examine yourself passage in 1 Corinthians 11, 28. I'm not trying to embarrass anyone. I won't mention the name of the church, but listen to this. They say, quote, examining yourself means that before participating in communion, a person must examine all of his or her life for sin. This includes words, deeds, thoughts, and even the motives and intentions of their heart. If any unconfessed sin is found, it must be dealt with because the unrepentant Christian is not qualified to partake in communion. Therefore, communion should only be taken after a Christian has fully confessed to Jesus and laid the guilt of their sin at the foot of his cross. Anything less insults the sacrifice that Jesus made and disrespects God. Now, first of all, let me just say I love their heart. I love the fact that these people want to be pleasing to the Lord. And let me say this. If you're engaged in sin, it is never too early to repent and flee to the Lord. Okay, we should be people. But here's the question. When they say examine oneself means to examine your heart to see if you're good enough for the table, is that Paul's point? Now, there's three problems that I want to lay out for you with that view. First of all, consider what the prophet said, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 17, 9, when he said that the heart is deceitful above all else and is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Right away, and I'll I'll get into that verse a little bit more, right away that should say that if you and I think we can inspect accurately our hearts, I think we're on a fool's errand. Okay, now we're going to explore that further. But the second problem If you and I are called to examine ourselves to determine if we're good enough for the table, you know what you'll end up with? You're going to end up with two camps of Christians, the contrite and the humble who will never partake of the table. They'll always know they're not good enough for it. And then you'll have the rest of us who are liars and hypocrites who think we are good enough for it. Well, is that what you think Paul intended? Now, listen to me carefully. None of us are, at the end of the day, good enough for the table of the Lord. The table of the Lord is for those who have been made perfect by the imputed righteousness of Christ. And I'll I'll, I'll work on that a little bit, that idea at the very end of our message again. Now, the third issue, and this is where we want to be good readers, as Bob was rightly admonishing us today in Sunday school. Notice in verse 28 that I've highlighted read this idea of examining oneself. Notice that it is tied directly to the idea in verse 29 of judging the body rightly, notice highlighted in red, or not judging the body rightly. What I'm going to show you is that if you and I want to know what it means to examine ourselves, it means we have to judge the body rightly. That has to do with the corporate body of Christ, as I'm going to show you. But now, for just a moment, before I get into the text more, I want to broaden out and take a 30,000-foot view, as it were, of the entire New Testament. And the question I want to ask for just a moment does, is this, is does the New Testament require us as believers to examine our hearts? 
Do we see that elsewhere in the New Testament? And maybe a better question is, are we even capable of examining our own hearts accurately? Now, why do I say this? Well, because evangelicalism has a track record of listening to the Puritans when it comes to examination. Now, how many have ever heard of the Puritans? The Puritans are always examining their heart, they're dissecting it, and they're never sure of anything when it comes to their own heart. Okay, let me cite you a Puritan from the 17th century from England named Thomas Watson. Listen to what he says. He says, this is self-examination, quote, it is the setting up of a court of conscience and keeping a register there that by a strict scrutiny a man may see how matters stand between God and his soul. It is a spiritual inquisition, a heart anatomy, whereby a man takes his heart in pieces as a watch and sees what is defective therein. It is a dialogue with one's self, and then he concludes, he says, I commune with my own heart, unquote. Now, notice what Thomas Watson is advocating. What he's saying is that you and I are called to take our heart apart like a watch and examine every part of it. What's the problem with that? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, when that question is asked, who can understand it, there's an implied answer that Jeremiah expects the reader to come to. And the answer is nobody but God. Now, if nobody but God can understand the heart, again, are you and I not on a fool's errand if we're going to try to inspect our own? Now, let me just show you. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses mm -hmm. 3 through 5. I want you to see that the Apostle Paul did not examine his own heart knowing that he didn't have the ability to do so. And so that'll give more credence to what Jeremiah is saying. You'll see that it's not just Old, but it's New Testament as well. Again, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 5. Paul says this, he says, But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. Now stop there. In verse 4, Paul will acquiesce and say, Look, I don't know that I've done anything wrong. He examines his deeds but I think when he says, I don't even examine myself, he's talking about his heart and his motives. And you'll see why. Notice in verse 4, he says, For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me, and I think he's referring to his heart and his motives, is the Lord. Now here's the kicker. Notice verse 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Why does Paul rely upon God to understand the heart and the motives? Because only God can do it. That's the point of Jeremiah 17.9. So Paul is teaching the same thing. So what I want you to understand is that when we see the New Testament call us to examine something, we are only called to do objective examination. Now here's my claim. When we look at 2, uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Galatians 6, 4, and there's another text, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Those are all the passages in the New Testament that have to do with us examining something. It is always an objective examination or let me say it this way, an objective inspection of our doctrine and deeds. It is not a subjective introspection of our heart and motives that we're called to. Now, if you didn't get that all written down, I'm going to say that again at the end here. But let me prove this to you from Scripture. Notice here in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul does call for an examination. He says, test yourselves, you Corinthians, to see if you are in the faith, examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Now notice in this text, both test and examine are synonymous. So he's calling the Corinthians to examine themselves 
but he's not asking them to examine the motives of their heart. Notice he asks them, examine to see if you're in the faith. And the faith here has to do with the objective propositional content of the gospel. How do we know that? Because Paul uses in the faith and other passages where it's always in First and Second Corinthians referring to the propositional content of the gospel. I think of 1 Corinthians 16, I believe it's verse 13, where he says, be on the alert and stand firm in the faith. Now, when Paul says stand firm in the faith, is he saying stand firm in your feelings and your heartfelt feelings with the Lord? No, he's telling the Corinthians to stand firm in the propositional content of the gospel. And so here's the issue that was going on at Corinth. The irony is the Corinthians were examining Paul and they're saying, you're no apostle. You don't speak eloquently enough. And Paul says, hey, just for a moment, why didn't you stop examining me? And why didn't you examine yourself in light of the propositional content of the gospel? And by the way, the irony is if you pass the test and you're in the gospel, how did you hear about that gospel? The apostle Paul. If they pass the test, then so does he. That's the irony that he's using. But again, Paul isn't asking for subjective introspection of the heart. He's asking for objective inspection of their doctrine. Is that clear? Now, let's look at another examine yourself passage. Galatians 6.4. 2 Corinthians 13.5 is examine your doctrine. Galatians 6.4 is examine your deeds. Paul says, but each one must examine his own work. And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. Now, notice the call here by Paul is that we would examine our deeds, our work. And you and I can do that. We can look at the terms of the new covenant and we can examine what we're doing and we can ask, does that line up with what I'm commanded to do and not do under the terms of the new covenant laid out by Christ and his apostles? Well, certainly we can do that. So there's only one other passage in the Bible, in the New Testament, where Paul asks us to examine something. That's in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. It's the examination of doctrine again. So here's the grand point. In the New Testament, you and I are called to engage in objective inspection of doctrine and deeds in light of Scripture. We are not called to engage in subjective introspection of our heart and motives because we can't know that fully. Is that clear? That's the categories that we have to get down to understand what the New Testament is saying. Now, if that's what the New Testament is saying, then we should expect in 1 Corinthians 11, 28 that we're not called to introspection of the heart, but something else. And that's exactly what we find. So what we're going to look now is what does it mean to judge the body rightly? Why is this important? Well, let's read verse 29 again. Paul says, For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment, he's talking about the Lord's Supper, to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Now, before I said, if you want to know what it means to examine yourself, it is tied directly to judging the body rightly. Now, if you want to know what it means to judge the body rightly, do you know what you have to do? You have to understand what Paul means by the body. The whole battle over this passage is what in the world does Paul mean when he talks about the body? Now, throughout the history of Christendom, there has been three different interpretations of what Paul means by body here. The first one is that some Christians who are engaged in the idea of transubstantiation and consubstantiation, that's the idea that the elements turn into the physical body and blood of Christ, they view the body to refer to the elements of food. Now, that sounds really strange, but what they would say is what you have to discern rightly is what is appropriate food for the Lord's Supper versus inappropriate food for the Lord's Supper. Why? Because they don't want Jesus Christ's body and blood turning into a hot dog or something that seems not very sanctified. But dear brothers and sisters, this idea of transubstantiation, consubstantiation, it's not that it's just in left field. It's not even in the ballpark. It's not even the metropolitan area. It has nothing to do with the Apostle Paul's point. Okay? And you'll see why that is. Now, the second understanding of the body 
is the common view today. And that is most Christians view the body here as the physical body of Christ that was sacrificed. And so the idea then is to discern the body rightly means you discern the significance of that and you don't tolerate sin in your life. That's a wonderful sentiment, but again, it's not Paul's point here. The third option is the option that we have to go to because of the context. The body certainly here is referring to the corporate body of Christ, namely other believers who have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Now, how do we know that? Because of the context of 1 Corinthians 11. What I'm going to do is show you one chapter earlier and one chapter after the body is used for the corporate body of Christ, namely believers. Let me show you one chapter earlier, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. Here Paul is warning the Corinthians about their abuse at the pagan temples. He says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Verse 17, he says, Since there is one bread, notice, we who are many are what? One body. For we all partake of the one bread. Now, that body there is certainly a reference to the corporate body of Christ, to believers. Now, think about one chapter after 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, Paul says about the body of Christ, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Now, why does he say that? What Paul doesn't want to have happen is one part of the body, one member, one person, the eye says to another Christian, the hand, I don't need you. He, re he realizes that the entire body of Christ needs one another. So there, Paul is using the body of Christ again for the corporate body, not his physical body. Think of another analogy. This is very helpful. Acts chapter 9, remember Saul is on the way to Damascus and Jesus confronts him in the resurrection. Do you remember what Jesus says to him? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting Christians? No, he doesn't say that, does he? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So associated with Jesus Christ are believers that if a believer is hurt or persecuted, Jesus says it's done to him. That's how you and I are the body of Christ. That's the point in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, let me give you absolute proof of this in the context of 1 Corinthians 11 itself. Let me read. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 through 22. Paul's rebuking them. He says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Verse 20 says, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Now, let me set the context in the culture of the day. Remember, Corinth sits squarely in the Greco-Roman world. And in the Greco-Roman world, what would often happen is different families would be seated for dinner according to their social class. So if you were part of the wealthy social class, you would be seated in what's called a triclinium. A triclinium was a private room that the wealthy could afford, and then they would bring in their choicest food. But all of the poor people would be relegated to what was called the atrium. The atrium was just a public place where they would bring in the little morsels that they had, and that's where they would eat. Now, it's one thing to have that in the culture, but what Paul's rebuking the Corinthians for is that culture came into the church. You had wealthy Christians excluding poor Christians from the table of the Lord, and therefore you no longer had the body of Christ and the table of the Lord, you had something else. And that's what Paul says. Notice in verse 20, he says, Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. Whatever supper you're having, Paul says, it isn't the Lord's. Why? Notice verse 21, he gives an explanatory for. He says, For you're in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, there's the poor Christian, 
and another is drunk, I think implied that's the wealthy Christian. Now, notice in verse 22, he also says what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Notice that last phrase, shame those who have nothing. It proves that that's exactly what was going on at Corinth. The wealthy Christians were excluding the poor Christians, shaming those who had nothing. Now, proof that, again, the body of Christ is in fact the church. Notice what I have highlighted in red. Notice up in verse 18. When you come together as what? The church. That's the body. Notice in verse 20, when you meet together as what? As the church is implied. That's the body. Notice in verse 22, do you despise the church of God. That's the body. Could Paul be any more clear what the body is? So dear brothers and sisters, what we had going on at Corinth was the wealthy Christians there were not celebrating the Lord's Supper. They're having their own dinner parties, excluding the other brothers and sisters, and therefore it was no longer the table of the Lord. Let me show you graphically what this looks like. Think of this picture here. You see all the people in a circle. By the way, thank you to Christy for helping me get these uh, good graphics. My graphics are horrible. She does a lot better job. Think of this as representing the body of Christ at Corinth. What the wealthy Corinthians were doing is excluding some. They're saying, now you don't really fit in. You don't really fit in. You don't fit in. And so you no longer, therefore, had the body of Christ. It wasn't the full body. That is precisely what was angering the Apostle Paul. Now, here's the irony I want you to consider. The majority of evangelicalism in their pietistic leanings has taken the examine yourself passage to mean we have to see if we're good enough for the supper. Well, obviously some Christians are going to say, you know what, I'm not good enough this week for the supper. And you end up with this result. So ironically, by not understanding the examine yourself and what it really means, you end up with the same result where Christians who should be part of the table end up being excluded. And so ironically, if we don't get the examine yourself right, we're going to be doing the same abuse to people practically that the original Corinthians were doing. That's what Bob and I have been so animated by, that we have to understand these warnings and get it right. Now, let me move on here again, talking about judging the body rightly. I'm not going to read verses 28 through 29. I just want to set the context. Notice in red, we're talking about judging the body rightly. How do we judge the body rightly? You know what? Paul tells us. Isn't that nice of him? Right away in verse 30, all the way to 34, Paul tells us what it means to judge the body rightly. He says, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, verse 33, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Now, notice in the beginning of this text in verse 30, and into 31, Paul says that because you haven't rightly judged the body, that is the corporate body of Christ, some of you have become sick, and some of you have even died, they fell asleep. Now, how do we know that that happened? Because an authoritative apostle, Paul, was on the scene. Now, does that mean if we see somebody sick, we say, you know what, maybe you're abusing the Lord's table? I don't think we do that. Why? Because we don't have an authoritative apostle or prophet to tell us, but Paul was. And he could tell them by the authority of God that their abuse of fellow believers at the Lord's table led to some being sick and even some dying. But notice even right away in verse 32, he clarifies, he says, well, when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned with the world. The idea there is this wasn't the wrath of God. This was actually the discipline of the Lord to keep them from making any graver error. Now, the key issue, though, is what should we do to rightly judge the body? Paul concludes, he gives us a summary, he says, so then, this is what we are to do. He says, so then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, that's the Lord's Supper, wait for one another. That's it. I get paid to tell you that it's wait for one another. <laughs> that's it. 
You don't have to, as Thomas Watson was saying, take your heart apart like a watch and dissect it. Paul's just saying, wait for one another. You don't have some rascal rich guy going off having his own dinner party, excluding everybody else. Just wait for one another so that the whole body is together because the body together is the body of Christ. Now, let me just prove something logically. Let me show you some logic here in this text. I'm going to pull up my pointer. I just usually ends up in a disaster with my pointer, but we'll see. His conclusion is wait for one another. And waiting for one another is how we are to judge the body rightly. And if you judge the body rightly, then you're properly examining yourself. Let's go the other way. If you properly examine yourself, you judge the body rightly so that what? You wait for one another. That's the logic of the text. It has nothing to do with us saying, you know what, I don't know if I'm good enough this month for the table of the Lord. It's about waiting for other brothers and sisters so that the whole body is represented at the table of the Lord. That was Paul's concern. So what Paul is simply saying is if you have this, you have some excluded from the Lord's table, he wanted them to do this. Make sure everyone is in fact together. That's the grand point. Now, let me address a critique of this. Some in the more pietistic circles of evangelicalism will react against Bob and me and they'll say, you know what, you two guys are just light on sin. Let me ask you, is it light on sin to properly interpret the word of God? I don't think so. In fact, I would say that that's part of what it means to contend for the faith. And here's the irony. Those in the pietistic movement who will separate believers, for example, for not holding to a confession or creed or saying, you know what, I don't think you're good enough this week for the Lord's table or this month. Ironically, they're the ones who are doing this. They're the ones who are violating the commands of the Apostle Paul and therefore Christ himself. Dear brothers and sisters, we have to ask the question, why is it so significant, this Lord's Supper? Why is it so damaging to believers that they would ever be excluded from the table of the Lord? The reason why is God has given us the table of the Lord as a means of grace. Now, for some of you that are new here, what means of grace are, they are tools that God uses to further sanctify his people and enable them to persevere. All right, so let me give you an example from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in Exodus 12, verses 23 through 27, the people of God then, the Israelites, were commanded to remember the Passover. And they were to do that even into the Promised Land. Why? Because they always were to remember the significance of what their God had done so that they would persevere unto glory. Now, what happens, of course, is they don't do this well. And they end up falling in disbelief, of course, in the wilderness. But now, we as believers in the new covenant, we have the Lord's Supper. And we are commanded to do this in remembrance of Christ. Why? So that we will persevere through the wilderness and go on into the promised land. It is a tool that God uses to keep in the front of our minds what Christ has done once and for all for us. And so this is why the early church devoted themselves to the means of grace that we see in Acts 2.42. Notice here, it says that they, that's the early church in Jerusalem, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's the word of God, and to fellowship. The fellowship is what we're doing now. It is the arena in which all of the other tools or means are dispensed. The breaking of bread, that's the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And notice that the early church, they devoted themselves to these things. In the Greek, that implies they did this despite opposition, and they did it with great fervor. Now, it doesn't say how often we have to do it. We just do these things. We are commanded to be about the same things. Now, if these means are taken away, what happens? If a Christian is excluded from the Lord's table, a tool that God uses for the good of his people has been taken away. And I want you to consider this. Look on the list there. Notice the apostles' teaching. How many in here would say, you know what? I think you're too sinful this week. You shouldn't be hearing the apostles' teaching. You shouldn't be listening to the word of God. Well, wouldn't you, all of you rightly react and say, well, no, the word of God is precisely what might bring them to repentance. The same thing with the table of the Lord. Think of it this way. Dear ones, if a person is not too sinful to hear the apostles' teaching, he or she is not too sinful 
to partake in the Lord's Supper. Now, as I lay all that out, there is one case in which Christians, and it's debatable whether they're Christians or not, but people should be excluded from the Lord's table, and it's this. If someone's under church discipline, okay? So apart from church discipline, every professing Christian should have access to the table of the Lord. Let me make my case. Remember in 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul was very angry because there was a particular man who lived a sexually immoral lifestyle by having his own father's wife. Well, Paul was aghast that they didn't do discipline with him. So he lays the discipline out, and notice what he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. He says, I wrote to you in my letter, and by the way, this is the letter that was lost. We don't have this anymore. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would have to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. So he's talking about the church. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So notice if someone's under church discipline, we are not to even associate with them. And notice in red where it says not even to eat with such a one, you might say, well, maybe that has to do with not going to McDonald's with somebody under church discipline. I think a good case can be made. It means that as well. But it certainly means that we are not to have table fellowship in the table of the Lord with them. That is the only way that somebody should be excluded as a believer from the table of the Lord. So that's not being light on sin. Now, why should people who are under church discipline be excluded from the table? The unique thing about people who are under church discipline is that they are claiming the right to sin. We had this not long ago. We had church discipline with a couple, and they remained under church discipline. They couldn't have a part in the Lord's table because they were claiming the right to engage in their sinful behavior, therefore making themselves Lord rather than Jesus Christ as Lord. That's why people who are under church discipline will not be having a part of the table here at Gospel of Grace Fellowship. So that's the only exclusion, though, that I think we see in Scripture. Okay, now, who is invited, dear brothers and sisters, to the table of the Lord? Well, all believers are. And sadly, the warnings that have been abused where it says, examine yourself, because those haven't been properly understood, too many Christians have been wrongly excluded from the table. Listen to what the great scholar Gordon Fee said about it. He's probably my favorite on 1 Corinthians. He said this. He said, quote, The very table that is God's reminder and therefore his repeated gift of grace, the table where we affirm again who and whose we are, has been allowed to become a table of condemnation for the very people who most truly need the assurance of acceptance that this table affords, the sinful, the weak, the weary, One does not have to get rid of the sin in one's life in order to partake. Here by faith, one may once again receive the assurance that Christ receives sinners. Dear brothers and sisters, you and I are going to be partaking in the Lord's table. And I want to assure you that you are not good enough for the Lord's table and neither am I. But this isn't a fellowship for the good enough The table is the fellowship of those made perfect. Not through our own doing, but through the imputed righteousness of Christ that belongs to those who have drawn near through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And therefore, dear brothers and sisters, the table of the Lord is your table today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the clarity that you bring to us in Scripture. We thank you, Lord, that you are so kind as to give us a table where we can proclaim your greatness, what you've done for us, and the fact that we remain your people all the way to glory. I do pray, Heavenly Father, for my brothers and sisters here that we would understand what these warnings were about, that we would be able to help perhaps others who have distorted them, also that your table may be complete with those who belong to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to be celebrating, ironically, here in the Lord's Supper. We planned it, by the way.
But what I'm going to do is lead us through the words of institution, but we're first going to dispense the, the elements. And what we do at Gospel of Grace is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're welcome to the table. We hand out the bread and the, the cup. And what I'll do is after the song is over, I'll come back up and lead you through and we'll take of the cup and the bread together as I lead us through that. I think we have the words of institution on the screen there. I'll read them again and we'll partake together. Paul said again in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Dear brothers and sisters, as we partake of the bread, let us remember Christ's broken body as a substitute for us so that we can be with him forevermore. Let's remember that. Thank you, Lord. Verse 25, it says, In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Dear brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has brought us into the new covenant, the eternal covenant, through his shed blood. It's also promised that he's coming again to drink with us anew the fruit of the vine in his Father's kingdom. Perhaps next time you and I partake of this cup, it'll be with him and all of one another in the kingdom. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Let's drink. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for what your Son did for us on the cross, that through his broken body and shed blood, we have the remission of sins once and for all, that we have forgiveness, that we have redemption, that we have eternal life and a future glorious resurrection to look forward to. We're so grateful, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would remember your greatness and your goodness to even us who are sinners. And we thank you for all of these things that you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. What an honor, brothers and sisters, to share the Lord's table with you today. I want to thank everyone for the wonderful worship and the setup and also for those who prepared our meal that we're going to have. I'm going to leave you with a benediction here from Jude about what God is doing for us. He says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you all at our dinner.